Hi, everybody. I'm Linda Solomon Wood. Thanks for joining us today. I'm editor in chief of Canada's National Observer, and I'm here today with Catherine Marr, the CEO of Wikimedia. Thanks for joining us today, Catherine. Thank you so much for having me. So the Trump era might have come and gone, but the age of disinformation seems like it's here to stay. Um, what was already a humming misinformation machine before 2016 has over the past five years evolved into a world building juggernaut capable of reshaping economies, politics and social structures. So without going more deeply into that context, which I think you know everybody on this call will have, let's jump right in to the um, faltering information ecosystem into which Wikimedia Foundation CEO and Executive Director Catherine stepped in, into in June 2016. Wikimedia oversees Wikipedia along with Wiktionary, Wikiquote, and other projects. And it's the collective name for a global movement that aims to harness the collaborative power of the internet by creating and sharing free knowledge. So Catherine, I understand this is the last interview or one of the last interviews you're going to be doing as CEO of Wikimedia. Is that yeah. great? And so I'm just, you know, looking back over your time with um, Wikimedia, what is your perspective on uh, information being free? Oh, um, well, I believe in it as strongly as the day that I walked in, if not more so. Um, when I joined Wikipedia, I always thought, oh, this would be interesting, but I didn't think that it would be, I didn't anticipate that it would be so deeply relevant to the moment that we find ourselves in mm -hmm. on questions of the role and responsibility of, of, sort of tech platforms, the questions of con information integrity and trust. Um, so where I come to this conversation right now is really just a deep belief that if we want people to trust information, then we need to invest in information and we need to invest in a, an ecosystem of, of high quality information or, or knowledge. Um, and Wikipedia is just one piece in that in that puzzle, but hopefully we have some lessons that we can offer to the broader knowledge ecosystem. And we're going to get into a lot of that in the next hour. Um, thank you so much for that. Um, over a billion people are visiting. You said a billion and a half people are visiting Wikipedia every month um, in search of fact. Is that what they're finding? For the most part, Wikipedia is as, probably as accurate as it, it has ever been. And as you know, sort of statistically speaking, we consider it to be as accurate as any long or any traditional insight bound printed version of an encyclopedia ever has been. That is to say that the higher um, traffic articles tend to be the highest quality and then there's sort of a long tail after that, which means that most articles that get hundreds or thousands or tens of thousands of page views are very, very high quality. Yeah. And then the articles that perhaps don't get quite as much traffic may have a few errors here and there. I always like to say, you know, the leader of a nation, A plus article, um, a 1980s garage band may have a little softness in it. But the beauty of the way that that model works for Wikipedia is the more uh, relevant or pertinent a piece of information is to the largest number of people, the more high quality it's going to be. And, and that sort of is a feature of the way that Wikipedia works in a, in a really nice uh, way. Tell us about what your role with the Wikimedia Foundation has been. Sure. So the Wikimedia Foundation is the nonprofit charitable organization that sort of supports Wikipedia. That means that we are technically we own the software, we operate the, uh, the servers that make Wikipedia possible, we employ the engineers and um, many, many other people, but en engineers who run the sites and ensure that you can access Wikipedia on any device from anywhere in the globe, that it's secure, fast, reliable. We also support the global community that makes Wikipedia possible. So at the foundation, we don't write or edit Wikipedia. We support and enable others to do so. And we have a community of nearly 300,000 
editor volunteers who write Wikipedia on a monthly basis, millions over time. Um, and so we provide the capacity building support for people who are learning how to edit Wikipedia, the organizing support for local communities in different languages, countries, uh, thematic areas, so education, the cultural sector for folks who want to participate. And then of course, as a traditional sort of backbone nonprofit, we do fundraising and we make sure that everything sort of runs appropriately and are transparent and people know who to, whose door to knock on if they have a question. So that's, that's the foundation. Um, in my role, uh, I just oversee that. I like to say that um, it's really about sort of helping people set a direction that is already within their aspirations for what Wikipedia can and should be and, and just helping articulate and shape that for the world. What are the biggest challenges that you've encountered over the last five years in sort of the overall management of this mass of information? <laughs> uh, so, I mean, the very first thing that that I really wanted to focus on uh, as Wikipedia future uh, was what is our actually what is our future where do we want to go from here so I stepped in just around the time of our 15th birthday mm -hmm. and we had started as this free encyclopedia anyone could edit but the question was what what does that lead us to what should we be working on how do we think about what that means for the future of free knowledge what do people's what are people's needs of an encyclopedia what about all those places where wikipedia isn't as large or isn't as high quality or isn't as relevant and really bringing together our global community our global stakeholders donors readers um, researchers um, reusers of wikipedia to, to think about the future of free knowledge and set a direction for, for 2030, you know, looking 30 years out um, from Wikipedia's founding. And then the second piece of that was really around, okay, how do we ensure our technology is ready for that? Because we had transitioned from being created at a time, a very different time for the web. Uh, you know, people were mostly on desktops, laptops who weren't even as popular. And now we have not only mobile phones, but we also have things like voice assistants and rapidly changing experiences. So what does Wikipedia look like down the line in terms of thinking about what it feels like, how you experience it, how you access knowledge. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and so in terms of, so, so you, one of your challenges was, what does that lead us to? What are we trying, where are we trying to go with this? Do you feel like um, that has really been answered? Do you, and, and also along, you know, and if, if you've been able to answer that, I'm really interested in what you feel like that's been able, you, you have to teach, you know, other platforms and. So the answer is yes, absolutely. I think we know where we're going and no, never, we're, we've never fully landed on the answer because one of the beautiful things about this almost impossible project of Wikipedia mm -hmm. is that every single person who comes to it and becomes a contributor mm -hmm. affects change in how it exists, whether it's literal, a change to the articles, the website, or it is a new voice in the room and a new conversation and perspective. Um, but in the next 10 years, what we're really focused on is looking at how we go from being a website that is an encyclopedia to thinking of ourselves holistically as a ecosystem of free knowledge that mm -hmm. is Wikipedia plus the other sites you mentioned at the beginning. So Wiktionary, Wikimedia Commons, Wikidata, but also our relationship and responsibility to other knowledge entities. So we partner today with global health organizations around information for the COVID-19 pandemic. We partner with academic institutions, libraries, people who are deeply vested in ensuring that public knowledge is truly public. And so what can we do as not just Wikipedia, but as a really well known and popular and highly trafficked free site in the public interest to put free knowledge at the center of an agenda around the public good. That that's it's really so amazing and just the scale of it is is kind of mind boggling. Um, I, I recall a few years back that there was an effort there was talk on Wikipedia for a moment at least about becoming a news site. Mm. Or about right? Yeah. So Jimmy Wales, our founder, is um, he and I share a very similar passion on this, which is that Wikipedia is just one piece of a high quality information ecosystem. Mm -hmm. And news and the resiliency and of a thriving free press is so essential 
to that knowledge ecosystem. Jimmy actually, independent of Wikipedia and independent of the Wikimedia Foundation, launched a project called Wiki, um, Wiki Tribune, which was he was interested in exploring how you could use Wiki-like principles of um, open peer review to really think about addressing challenges of, of bias or trust in, in the news. Mm -hmm. So uh, I know that he is still very interested in pursuing that through some of his, his private projects. And I, I think we certainly see a lot of overlap in the role Wikipedia plays as a general knowledge resource, but also the role Wikipedia plays as part of the public dialogue around current events and offering context in breaking news events, but also helping people sort of parse through some of the biggest questions of the day, be that you know everything from climate policy to uh, major political elections. Um that brings me to another question, which is around the issue of, you know, again, what people find, you say mostly they get facts when they come to Wikipedia. So I'd like to talk to you a little bit about what happens when they don't get facts. Mm. What happens in the sort of corners of Wikipedia where, in, in any online platform for that matter, where various different kinds of people are figuring out how to game the system, how to, you know, in the case of Wikipedia, go in and touch up their, you know, the Koch brothers are an example of, you know, the Koch brothers, it came out that they were hiring a PR firm to touch up their Wikipedia page and um, make it look better. And, you know, so, so part of my question is, you know, you've got 300,000 citizen editors that are trying to deal with this. Can they really deal with it? And what kinds of conversations have gone on at Wikimedia about this kind of problem? Oh, so many. And it is a very large area to wade into, as well as one that's been something we've been working on for many years, not just since this conversation around disinformation, but really since Wikipedia was founded. And mm -hmm. so um, forgive me if I may, uh, I'll go back a little bit to the beginning. So when Wikipedia first got started, uh, it was, we didn't have policies around what kind of information belongs in Wikipedia or how we would cite this information. That all, all had to be created by the volunteers. Mm -hmm. And it, it was working pretty well until I think sort of mid 2000s, 2006, there was an incident with a hoax um, around a uh, very well-known in the United States journalist. And John Siegenthaler. The, yes, exactly. We he call was it my Siegen first boss. Oh my I, goodness. My first job was with John Siegenthaler at the Tennessean. So and I know that story well, but please go ahead and tell us. Yes, and so we call it the Siegenthaler incident in the annals of Wikipedia because there was a hoax on, on John Siegenthaler's page um, and that a hoax was very harmful to him personally. Yes. It also led Wikipedia to realize that, wow, we'd gone from being an experiment to really something that had an impact on the public discourse. And so during that time, the editing community tightened up a number of its policies around what happens when we have a biography of a living person, someone who's a historical figure and you get something wrong. I mean, it's not great, but it, the real impact of harm is far less. Someone who's a living person, this is this is their real life. This is a very big deal. And so we tightened up those policies. And so we refer to it as our BLP, Biographies of Living Person Policy. And that really set the stage for a close appreciation for Wikipedia editors for what does it mean to hold the responsibility of not just being this public free resource, but also perhaps the primary resource in many instances. In 2013, the Wikimedia Foundation really working with the Wikimedia communities blocked and banned a number of PR editing um, operations that are not the sort of PR firms you may have heard of, the, the bigger well-known blue chip ones, but sort of shady folks that were manipulating Wikipedia's policies and, and drew a line in the sand saying, we're not, and I, I realize this is an anachronistic reference, we're not the yellow pages, we're, we're not meant to be an advertising platform. Um, we're really here to provide neutral knowledge. 
at 2013 block was then accompanied in 2014 by an effort to, to define what this means to manipulate Wikipedia. We call it black hat editing. It's mm -hmm. where people come in and they contribute to an article, they whitewash an article, or they remove unpleasant facts about an individual. And they do so because they have a paid interest in doing so because mm -hmm. they're trying to manipulate the system. This is a violation of our terms of use. It is against our policies. We have since then worked very closely with Wikipedia editors to focus on how, what tools they might need to be able to identify these types of efforts, because these tend to be sophisticated technical efforts to circumvent the policies of Wikipedia, and they tend to be employed by people who have resources to do so. Where this intersects in a very interesting way with the current discourse around fake news is that some of the biggest concerns that we had in beginning in 2015 and 16 was efforts not just by PR agencies, but by governments, um, non-state non actors to manipulate information in the public interest. Mm -hmm. So not just sort of cleaning up, you know, the article of a company, but but really influencing the public discourse and understanding of politics, major um, social issues. And the things that those people do, those things that people try to manipulate Wikipedia do are so similar to the things that these PR type groups mm -hmm. have done, which meant that we were actually in a much better place than you'd expect. Because in the intervening 15 years, Wikipedia had developed policies, practices, tools, software to help track down, identify, block and ban these types of activities. And then be able to flag articles that were the topics of suspicious activity. Mm -hmm. So as we went into this most recent, um, for example, United States election, mm -hmm. the Wikimedia community, we worked in, con in concert with the community, the Wikimedia Foundation, to really think about how to identify threats to high quality information on the project, identify patterns of editing that are suspicious in nature, uh, what we call protect articles, which is to essentially lock or soft lock them to avoid manipulation, either for a period of time or indefinitely. And mm -hmm. that has helped safeguard the integrity of Wikipedia's information. Mm -hmm. um, which is to say, we don't always get it right. And sometimes things sort of sneak up you know, on us, but, um, but by and large, as soon as something comes to the attention of the Wikipedia editing community, or to the attention of the public, Wikipedia editors are extremely responsive and are able to not only go in and sort of lock that article down, but also to correct the record and make sure that it's reverted to the most accurate and most recent form. Catherine, um, a reader, uh, sorry, someone on the chat, yeah, his name slipped by me when it came through. Um, made a comment, truth does have an opinion. And before you comment on that, um, I want to just say that, you know, I'm sure that I'm not alone and having had the experience of having a Wikipedia page that because National Observer has done a lot of reporting on the energy industry and, you know, um, controversial topics mm -hmm. that um, that page has been messed around with in terms of the facts and the in a in a way that seemed to wish to distort the truth mm -hmm. and most people like you're talking about you know the PR firms that go in and do it and you've created a structure to deal with the people that are going in and trying to you know whitewash things but how are you dealing with you know National Observer is not on the scale of like, you know, the kind of page that thousands of Wikipedia editors would be going to, to be sure that it had, you know, that it was accurate. So what about those smaller pages and what happens to, you know, smaller, you know, people like us when, you know, defamation or damaging material shows up on a page? I, I'm it is one of the questions that I get most frequently. And okay. it is That's one that, <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> and yeah. it is one that we don't have a perfect answer to, to mm -hmm. be totally honest with you. I think mm -hmm. that because Wikipedia has scaled so um, greatly to the yeah. point of English Wikipedia has 6 million articles. As I mentioned at the outset, articles about, you know, mm -hmm. elected national leaders tend to be very high quality. Mm -hmm. But when it does come to what I think of as sort of 
in pages about institutions or pages mm -hmm. about people who perhaps are not as well known. Mm -hmm. Sometimes those articles are not as high quality as we'd like to see. And mm -hmm. in at times that's because they don't have the visibility. And mm -hmm. at times it's also because perhaps there isn't as much publicly available information mm -hmm. that we could rely on to write those articles. So Wikipedia is written using secondary news sources. Jimmy, our founder likes to say, you know, um, he, he considers himself a good cook and a good parent, but no one writes about that. And so that's not in his Wikipedia page. Instead, it's <laughs> all of the information about, you know, his founding of Wikipedia, the mm -hmm. decision to make it a nonprofit and, the, and his current sort of ventures. Yeah. And so sometimes there's a misalignment between mm -hmm. what we would like to see in these pages and, and what is actually there. Yeah. And, and this is, that's a, that's a broader question. It, that sort of gap um, in knowledge is particularly pernicious when it comes to women, people of color, in terms of their representation. Absolutely, I'd love to talk about that, but I want to speak to your question, which is one of the things that we are trying to do with our editing community mm -hmm. is to figure out when the numbers of editors have remained relatively small, mm -hmm. but the number of articles continues to grow, how can we equip editors with the tools they need to be able to track changes across the projects in a way that helps them identify when vandalism or manipulation is occurring. And so we are working on developing tools that are based on, I don't like to call it AI, machine learning, that helps us identify edits to pages and helps cross-reference the sort of size and quality or assumed quality of those edits with the account of the editor in order to, be able to say, oh, it's a new account, or I've never seen this editor before, and they're mm -hmm. editing on this page. Does that mean we should look at it because maybe that is sort of suspicious versus mm -hmm. this is an experienced editor who tends to work in the area of covering mm -hmm. sort of current events, for example, and mm -hmm. help people triage do I need to pay attention to this and, and zoom in a little bit further? Or is that, you know, um, someone from down the road who I've interacted with before and I'm pretty sure they're, they're just doing their thing? Well, these are, you know, there must, these are your thousands of problems with so many, you know, what millions of articles. I wanna go to a question that came in from uh, David Russell Brake who asks, Looking at the research priorities set out by the Wikimedia research team, I see a strong emphasis on measuring knowledge gaps in terms mm -hmm. of content, but much less on participation gaps. I find that page creation and editing remains difficult. How are your researchers planning to find ways to broaden and deepen your editor base? Yes, so the participation gaps, uh, the research team is really focused on, as you said, knowledge gaps, which look at issues such as where what knowledge is underrepresented and some of the more structural components to that. The software uh, developers who work on our product team, such as our new editing team, um, are really the ones who are focused on how do we bring new editors into the projects and what are the changes? So that page creation process. In English Wikipedia, you're absolutely right. It is tough to create a new page. There's no onboarding that says, here are the policies around verifiability and uh, notability. We are working right now in a cooperative exploration with four different Wikipedias, Catalan, Arabic, uh, Korean, and Czech, which are all medium-sized Wikipedias, to experiment with onboarding experiences that help you go from a newbie to somebody who is uh, I don't want to say fluent, but familiar with some of these processes, these policies, and walks you through sort of a welcome to Wikipedia experience and says, are you interested in editing on these topic areas? Can we pair you with a mentor who's an experienced Wikipedian so that you can have someone to ask questions of? Really thinking about learning from best practices that are very common in other sites to help welcome people in and guide them through that process. If we're successful in these four Wikipedias, which so far we've seen great response, we plan to roll that out to other Wikipedias as well. Um, and one of the nice things about this is that it's not just about helping any new editors. We found this has a particular resonance with women and with marginalized or minority communities in helping them come into the projects and contribute their knowledge in a way that feels welcoming and enables them to really have a sense of how their participation is mattered and it matters and is appreciated in the Wikimedia spaces. Well, let's get this question out of the way. You're, you're talking about marginalized communities and <clears throat> women. 
I read that 18% of the notable biographies on Wikipedia are only 18% are of women. Mm -hmm. Is that still true? I think that was from a couple of years ago. And what's the deal with that? What's the deal? So uh, I hate to tell you it's worse than that. It was 15%. No, 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 it's okay. It's, it is 18%, but it was 15% a few years ago and it is 18% today, which it's tough to hear that, but I want to share one, one sort of note, a good note with your, with your audience that represents 73 or 74. I did the numbers once brand new articles about women every single day that are being written. And the reason that matters is that very often writing web articles about women is actually much harder than writing articles about men, not just because of Wikipedia's own policies, but there was a study from the London School of Economics that found that men are uh, five out of six references to an expert in the press are male as opposed to representing women experts. So it's much harder oftentimes to find high quality resources about influential and notable women that we can then use to build their articles. So 73 articles mean 73 hard earned, you know, well, hard fought articles. Now, having said that, we know that's not enough. Absolutely. That is something that hurts my heart. It is something that bothers every single one of us in the foundation, which is why as part of our strategic priorities for 2030, we declared for what we call knowledge equity, which is really thinking about how do we map the gaps in Wikipedia? So that's that knowledge gaps in the research agenda. How do we identify communities that have been in our language left out by or excluded by power and privilege? Um, how do we break down those barriers either in our own experiences as Wikipedia perhaps it's that editing experience that we need to fix, or really thinking about working within the social constructs of the communities that, that folks are living in. So that might be women don't have as much access to leisure time. It might be that the um, we worked with the community to actually ensure that their language was encoded so they could use keyboards to write in their own language of Nepalipi in Nepal. What are the ways in which we can support communities in really thinking about proactively redressing gaps and exclusion that have both been structural because of lack of access to time, like electricity, com computers, and also intentional and cultural and, um, and aspects of power. So, you know, recapitulation of like the Western canon that prioritizes white men, um, the erasure of indigenous communities, the erasure of black communities. These are the sorts of things that the we are build. The, sure, absolutely. One of the biggest initiatives right now that is longest running is an initiative called Art and Feminism, which is a global project every every March, we're in March right now, which is International Women's Day and, and Women's History Month in, in many places, um, to write women, um, um, non-binary folks, uh, people of women of color, people of color into understanding the nature of culture and art and the composition of that. And so we at the foundation, we offer grants to support this work. We use our platform and voice to elevate this. We work in partnerships with other institutions. We have a project running all this month called Rewrite History, which is not just looking at how do you write the history on Wikipedia, but how do you think about the other institutions that help formulate what is considered notable from grant making institutions to awards granting institutions to institutions of the media, institutions of research. How do we really think about redressing these gaps that have been so structurally biased for so long? Well, well, um, it's, it's, I, it, that number 18% is so staggering. And it's really, it really is a devastating number. When you think about you know, a billion and a half people going to Wikipedia. And, you know, clearly it's a societal problem, not just a, a Wikipedia problem, but um, it, it, it literally brings tears to my eyes when I think about it and, you know, the ramifications for women um, of just being excluded in that way from, Absolutely. you know, this idea of notability and, and significance. And, and I do want to say it is also a Wikipedia problem. So we, we say often Wikipedia holds a mirror up to society's biases, and, and that is true. But we also know that only um, a fewer than 20% of our editing community identify, and when I mean when I say that, I mean they volunteer their identity mm -hmm. as women. Mm -hmm. And the because we don't track people's demographics, because we have very strong privacy policies, mm -hmm. uh, we do run these surveys and ask people, you know, what what is your gender? How, you know, and 
and how does that affect your editing on the projects if it does at all mm -hmm. and the good news is and, and i recognize this is slim pickings on the good news in the last year we saw a statistically significant improvement from the last survey we ran it was 11 percent of editors uh presented themselves and said how I identified as a woman to 15%. And so I know that's small, but for us, that is actually trends a huge shift that is nearly a 50% increase. And mm -hmm. we are deeply, um, we're using that to say, what are the other ways in which we can invest in supporting women and other, other folks on the projects around looking at what are the supportive ecosystems that we can put in place? And we just launched a universal code of conduct. That was, a something that has been in the works for since I started, uh, in this role for five years now, uh, to really think about how do we raise the floor around expectations for participation, um, creating safe, welcoming, and inclusive spaces, eliminating harassment, providing people with redress if harassment exists, because it's so important that we create the space for everyone to participate in knowledge. You know, um, as I was thinking about this, the words of the, uh, the, the, the song, the very famous song from the musical Hamilton kept going through my head of, you know, who tells your story? Mm. Um, and for women whose stories are being told on Wikipedia as well, you know, how that narrative is created is, you know, another kind of possible problem. Absolutely. If, if the people creating it are largely you know, men and if misogyny is prevailing there. So um, in terms of, I, of the war against disinformation, Catherine, we're gonna to get to another question, but we're gonna take a really quick break before you answer that. And my question is gonna be, does Wikimedia have a way to win the war against disinformation that is in the works? And is there any secret weapon? But before you answer that, for those of you who've just joined us of late, I'm Linda Solomon Wood. I'm editor in chief of Canada's National Observer. And I'm here with Catherine Mayer, CEO of Catherine Marr, CEO of Wikimedia Foundation. And our topic is disinformation. You know, disinformation impacts people getting vaccinated, wearing masks, it gets in the way of a political consensus and action on climate. National Observer has been a leader in coverage of this issue in Canada, particularly during the last federal election. And um, all of that was made possible by our subscribers and our donors. And I want to thank all of you in our community who are here today. And if you're new to Canada's National Observer, welcome. We're a member of the Trust Project. And the Trust Project, I just saw, is going to be offering a webinar on creating notable pages for women journalists on Wikipedia. And um, National Observer is also part of Mother Jones's climate desk. We reach over half a million people monthly with the best fact-based climate journalism and journalism on politics and many other topics of interest to society. Um, so if you're not a subscriber yet, a special gift for those of you here with us now, we're offering a promo code in our chat just click on the link in the chat and use the promo co code CNO. Now back to my question to you, Catherine. Does Wikimedia have a way to win the war against disinformation? I don't believe that it is ever a question of winning the war because disinformation has been with us since we have had the mechanisms of mass information distribution. It has always been a part of the ecosystem in which we live because it's politically advantageous to power at times to to be less than truthful. And that is, it's also the case that it is politically advantageous to withhold information. In fact, I love to speak about how Wikipedia is a radical challenge to the notion of information and power because it starts from the position that everyone should have access to it. And now we're saying, well, not only should people have access to it, it should be accurate. And we should find a way to bring together differing perspectives into some form of what we think of as consensus. Wikipedia's way of approaching this is really around how do we take what is known and what is verifiable and then bring it together in concert with other known and verifiable things, facts. Someone used the word truth in the chat. I want to say we, I shy away from that word because I think that truth can be 
a challenging construct depending on you know whose history we're talking about and how do we synthesize those but what we can do is we can bring together facts or you know the best in scientific hypotheses and say this is what is known and verifiable here are the areas of controversy here is what is unknown or unverifiable and here is what we're presenting to you the reader to be able to come to a determination about what we can agree on at this particular point in time and so that is how wikipedia tends to take on the most difficult issues of the day is to search widely across multiple sources to seek consensus within those sources on dispute you know areas of dispute to present that information with citations back and references back to where that information comes from and then to always be open to the opportunity that an understanding that that information might change so I think of Wikipedians as really drawing on a few traditions that are um, deep in our, in our society, one of which is the scientific method. So we're just going to, when we get new data, we're going to update our models and we're going to update our understanding of an issue. And so, you know, Galileo would have not had an article on Wikipedia about um, uh, heliocentrism or, or because back in the day it would have all been, you know, the sun revolving around the earth, but science changes, our understanding of the world changes. So Wikipedia changes too. The next one is really around this idea of, of fact checking. So I think of journalism as really being the source of this in many ways. That's all of those citations at the bottom of every page. And you can see that things flagged. This is disputable, you know, citation needed. This article doesn't have enough sources or this article represents a breaking news event and therefore, you know, caution when you read it. And then the last is this idea of peer review. And now in Wikipedia's context, that's public peer review, which is to say it is not only that of experts, which can be very helpful in getting to the specifics of a scientific, you know, mathematical equation or the ex explanation of a complex construct in theoretical physics, but also peer review in the sense of what do we, the public, understand to be the history of an event? What do we, the public, understand to be notable about a notable individual? How do we contextualize this? What is missing? What is known? And that process of peer review helps shape a Wikipedia article as a whole. I think that those three things are actually tremendously useful forcing functions, plus as I mentioned at the beginning, our transparency, the fact that we every edit is visible, every citation is visible, you can see who the editors are, you can access the talk pages, the disputes, the discussions, which creates an mode of accountability to our readership that I think is so important. Catherine, you say there's no secret weapon. Um, so that's um, Just good doing reality the hard work. check. <laughs> yeah, <I think laughs> good we have reality to check. We it's a lifetime of work, huh? I think it's a lifetime of work. And it's also one, one critical thing is Wikipedia started from the position it wasn't to be trusted. And we have never just div you know, diverge from that position. We've always said that we're a work in progress. We've always said, please check the article, you know, the citations at the bottom of every article, read with a critical eye. I think that is true of every source of information out there. You know, every editorial um, operation I know publishes corrections and, and that happens and that's okay. We're not always going to get it right. Being mm -hmm. honest with our readers helps build trust. Build, building trust is how we continue to try to improve and how we have are in, in this war, perhaps not to win it, but to to do our best every day. Um, so I was um, reaching out, as I told you, to Taylor Owen, who is some of you on this call will know, is um, in Canada one of the leading authorities on the platforms and on disinformation. And so I was asking Taylor what he um, thought about Wikipedia, and he he said that he thinks very highly of Wikipedia and he thinks that Wikipedia is probably of all the platforms and Wikipedia is a different platform, kind of platform, but still of all the platforms that it's doing the best. And he said he thinks that that's because it's a nonprofit. And so I just wondered if you could speak to the nonprofit model of Wikipedia you know there's been a lot out there about how how Jimmy Wales could be, a billionaire <laughs> many times over had he only made it a private company, but he didn't. And now he's just, you know, not a billionaire. Poor Jimmy. Um, can you, but actually, this amazing thing has been created that, um, you know, it's doing pretty well. So how does the nonprofit model work? Yeah, well, I think Jimmy would, would say that, you know, this, he doesn't feel 
badly about this at all. It's Wikipedia yeah. and that's his legacy. Um, totally, but, totally. And it speaks to what a generous man he is. But the, yeah. the thing that I would say on that is that the nonprofit model helps us do a few things. One is that our donations um, our way, our donations are much like our editing. They mm -hmm. come from millions of people from all over the world. So together, collectively, we make Wikipedia possible. It means all of us have ownership in it. All of us have a stake in it. Um, that means that we're also accountable to no one but the public, because not just our donors today, but our potential donors tomorrow. Um, which is a very powerful motivation in terms of ensuring that we align with our mission and our mission alone. Mm -hmm. uh, it also is a great forcing function for saying we've got to use this money wisely because it belongs in increments of $3 and $15 to people who have donated to us. Mm -hmm. But I think in a different sense, it maybe to Taylor's point more deeply, because we don't have a for-profit model, we've been able to stay in a place where we don't have to monetize or um, optimize for certain behaviors. So we don't have to monetize content that can help us stay out of the realm of say paid promotional content. It doesn't matter to me what whether you are looking up something on an obscure 16th century form of Islamic art or if you are looking up information about a leading pop star. These are all forms of information that we consider equally valuable and equally valid. And that is a form of sort of content neutrality that doesn't require us to twist ourselves and not to get you to read something. Uh, we don't need you to stay on our site for a particular amount of time. We're perfectly happy if you come in, look up a fact and leave, or if you stay for far too long and forget to do your homework <laughs> assignment because you've opened all these tabs and found your way back to philosophy. <laughs> then the other piece of it is we don't have to track your data and create sort of an advertising revenue model that creates its own perverse incentives. And the the advantage of that means that we are not, um, we first of all, we can focus on the integrity of your search and your quest for information, but it, it does also free us from being in the place of having to, or the incentive to track short-term agendas in order to make quarterly profits reports uh, or quarterly earnings or investor outcomes. And so we can make decisions like, we are going to invest in the change over a two year period, or when we are pressured, uh, political pressure to censor information, we can say, yeah, we're not gonna do that. And if you cut us off, and this has happened, it happened in Turkey while I was CEO, um, if you cut us off for two and a half years, we're, we're still not going to bow to your pressure because the integrity of our information, we're in it for the long run. We're here for a hundred years. And if we censor something now, you'll never trust us not to censor something again. And so we'll take you on in court. We'll take you on in the, in the press. We'll take you on in public opinion. But our commitment here is the integrity of our work. And that is always going to be what drives and animates us. So Wikipedia then is like part of the public commons. Yes. Do you think that Facebook and Google and Twitter and these major platforms that have done a lot of good, but that have also been disruptors in society should become nonprofits that are part of the public commons as well? Ooh. Um... I mean, I remember when there was a conversation about Twitter, whether there was some conversation at one point about whether it should sell somewhere. And I was like, oh, it'd be so great if they made it a nonprofit. But <laughs> yeah, I mean, in, in an ideal world, I'd love to see a non-commercial interest for the, not just platforms, but you know, some of the best media in the world is that that is funded by the public. There is a, there is a, a public good in having public goods, right? I, I would say that since that's highly unlikely, the area that I focus on instead is what are the public accountabilities? How do we think about, um, this is a bit technical, but sort of public interoperabilities uh, that enable us to be able to access the values, uh, the value of those platforms in terms of connectivity and um, services without necessarily having to be sort of locked into one or another. So it, it's a little bit more complex, but I, I do not think it's likely uh, I would love to see other aspects and ways in which those platforms recognize themselves as instruments of, of, of public, public infrastructure. Well, do you think private companies like that, I mean, I think certainly in the beginning, I regarded Google as, you know, they're, I believe in a way, fell for their 
um, branding. I believe their mm. branding, you know, um, and their branding really was very much speaking to do no harm, you know, mm. so that's about the public good. But in fact, you know, these platforms, you know, Google, so much, again, so much good and so much harm has come of them. Um, so, like, you guys must be thinking about this and talking about this too, because you're in this space. Like, what do you think the public should be advocating for? So, uh, two things come to mind. There's a ongoing conversation about should we regulate tech yes. and my answer to that is we regulate everything yeah. <laughs> yeah. We, re we regulate our food supply systems our energy yeah. extraction systems you uh -huh. know we regulate everything so Why yes of course we should we regulate tech? of course we should regulate <laughs> tech the yeah. question is what kinds of regulation should we put in place what are yeah. the ways in which regulation can help avoid perverse incentives mm -hmm. um, and what are the ways in which regulation can actually be a boon to the industry mm -hmm. in the sense of giving it clarity about sort of its operational latitude and also mm -hmm. where those bright lines are Mm -hmm. I think regulation can be helpful for competition and innovation and help um, avoid, you know, become sort of introduce anti-monopoly um, incentives that can be mm -hmm. quite helpful. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, so that's one area. We can talk a little bit about regulation. The other area is really thinking about, I'm increasingly interested in this idea of responsible investing. So mm -hmm. your listeners may be familiar with this idea of ESG as a category of financial investing, which speaks to, I think it's environmental, social, um, uh, is that right? Yeah. But it's really about sort of like social good investments. And the idea behind ESGs is that conscient, conscientious investors, individuals, but most importantly, institutional investors mm -hmm. have the ability to nudge along large corporations that are public corporations in mm -hmm. their transparency, their accountability, their sustainability practices, mm -hmm. all of these sorts of questions um, that are really about how do these companies become good corporate citizens in a multi-share stakeholder approach. Mm -hmm. I don't think tech has been subject to that kind of pressure in by and large, simply because of the fact that we're not talking about sort of what's your, um, what's your climate mitigation plan. Mm -hmm. We're talking about broader social and political questions that are a little bit more nebulous and harder to get our hands around. Mm -hmm. But when we talk about things like privacy, when we talk about things like data surveillance, when we talk mm -hmm. about things like the Sorry. exclusion of, um, and the, the anti-patterns of how algorithmic bias can affect minority communities. Mm -hmm. These are very tangible issues that we have data around. And this is the sort of thing where investors can play a more active role. These are public companies. Let's hold them to account you know, for the dollars that, that we invest in them. Mm -hmm. um, this is a question that I am, you know, have been wanting to ask you. I'm not sure how much you think about this, but do you feel like Wikipedia has been a platform for climate denial? Mm. So uh, I, I actually don't. I am interested if you've seen instances of it. We, I've actually used some of the climate articles as great examples of how Wikipedia's neutrality it, approach works. Whereas, you know, sometimes when we talk about neutrality, people, comes to mind this issue, this idea of objectivity. And at least in the United States where I live, objectivity often means both sides. So person X says this and person Y says this, and we give them equal weight, despite the fact that one might be completely specious. You know, mm -hmm. So that's not what neutrality is meant to be on Wikipedia. Neutrality is meant to say, what does the preponderance of evidence or expertise say? And, oh, there might be some controversy. Let's make sure we address that. And many of Wikipedia's articles, at least in English Wikipedia, on climate issues, take the preponderance of evidence and say, yes, anthropogenic climate change, humans are creating climate, carbon, you know, carbon in the atmosphere. Uh, this has negative implications and repercussions across a whole wide variety of spaces. I found that to be actually a great example of how Wikipedia does not, and you know, then at the bottom, political controversy, small, you know, two paragraphs. Um, I find that to be a good example of how Wikipedia addresses climate and climate science. And we have a whole community that focuses on editing climate articles, improving them, increasing, you know, their focus. But mm -hmm. have you seen ways in which it has been used for climate denial? It kind of yes and no. You know, um, the bigger, I mean, I read that Wikipedia took down uh, and banned pages that gave that gave credence to 
scientists that claim that clim climate change is not man-made caused, not mm -hmm. caused by man. So, you know, that was cl so clearly, uh, you know, that was a clear sign to me that Wikipedia has been working on it and thinking about it and the editors have. Um, you know, but what's interesting about all this is the ways that it can creep in. Yeah. You know, as people kind of one by one, you know, thousand by thousand get in and, you know, write stories, um, mm -hmm. how, you know, an oil company, for, for instance, can, you know, once again, I'm going back to, you know, we know about the Koch brothers, but I'm assuming that it's happening still in many different ways. You know, people are, are looking at Wikipedia and thinking, how can we shift the dial a little bit there by, you know, going in and creating anonymous accounts and hiring people who are far away from our PR firms to do it. Um, and, you know, I, I just can imagine that's a big problem that's hard to over, overcome. So the way that Wikipedia editors look at sectoral um, groupings of articles is they create groups like, I'll, I'll speak to Wiki Project Med. You mm -hmm. mentioned earlier, misinformation is a very large public health problem. And I was so glad you said that because I think in 2016, we, we were saying that too, um, you know, anti-vaccination before this pandemic even existed. And most people were looking at it really as a partisan political issue, but it's not, it's, this is a public health issue in many ways. The way that Wiki, there's a group called Wiki Project Med, which is a group of clinicians, doctors, researchers, people who have an interest in medical, well-read people in, who have an interest in medical work. And they, in this COVID-19 pandemic, mapped more than 7,000 articles that were related to the COVID-19 pandemic. And every single time one of those articles got updated, somebody somewhere around the globe got a ping. There is an effort right now, and I, the only reason I'm not speaking to it directly is I'm less, slightly less familiar with the, the details of it, a very similar project around climate, which is brings together editors to look at areas of climate and sustainability and mm -hmm. climate and resilience uh, that are focused on how do we not only monitor climate articles, but also how do we improve them. So one of my favorite examples is in this past year, there was an effort with the Wikimedia South African chapter to bring together African climate scientists to say, you know, there's all this great information about global climate, but very little about how this directly affects African agriculture, how this directly affects African urbanization, how this directly affects African economies. So really bringing together folks with that mm -hmm. expertise to focus on that from a very specific situated African lens. So I I, I hope that we're not seeing what you, I, I know exactly what you're speaking of. It's that, you know, whether we think the Overton window is a real thing or not, it's that shift in narrative, the, you know, weasel words being introduced into articles, a loss of neutrality. And yet I also have a tremendous amount of, of confidence based on past experience in these groupings of editors who say, this is our issue, you know, climate's our issue, marine biology and climate's our issue. You know, how do we think about this holistically? Well, that is just incredibly inspiring to hear about, you know, that project, that climate project, because climate change is hard to understand, mm -hmm. you know, like really to break it all down and to understand. It's not just the oil industry, it's the concrete industry. It's the, it, and it's not anybody, it's, it's our whole world and how we're functioning. And, you know, if mm -hmm. we're going to get to net zero fast enough, you know, it, it's going to take so much industrial um, transformation. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Transformation of, of every kind. Yeah. And it's overwhelming. And so telling the story of that is overwhelming as well. And, you know, that that's just really incredible to hear about that project of editors that are going to get together and tell the story better. And that's really great. And so, um, I, I have like 20 more questions and our time is running out. So, oh my God, how, okay, let me try to narrow this down. Um, I guess I want to move away from um, the questions that I would have liked to have asked about 234 and libel and defamation mm -hmm. on platforms and how Wikipedia does that. And maybe we'll come back to that in another interview sometime. But today, I, I just, you know, it's your, as this is, you're moving away from Wikipedia and you're moving on in your own life. And so I just wanted to ask you, you know, how you see the future and, um, and you know, what you'd like to say about your time at Wikipedia. 
Oh. Wikimedia. Um, yeah, whole, oh, or all of it. It's <laughs> all the all wikis. It. It's all of the wikis. Well, one thing we say is you never truly leave the wikis. And that <laughs> that is true. I I that my time at Wikimedia has been among the richest and best times of my life. And the people that I've met are if you want in, to feel inspired to get out of bed in the morning and when the world is difficult and dark knowing Wikipedians is a good way to do it. Not just because they are savants and fonts of information of every sort, uh, but they are creative and delightful and curious, and they are united in this belief that we can actually do something together for the world that makes it a better place. And it is true that when you meet Wikipedians from every corner of the globe, from every background imaginable, from grannies to, to <laughs> students of 13 years of age, from Kazakhstan to Uruguay to uh, Korea, you are reminded of all the things that we have that unite us rather than all the ways in which we are separated. And in fact, the ways in which our diversity enriches what we know. And so I leave knowing that one of the things that you know makes us human is our curiosity. And one of the things that is the record of our curiosity is our knowledge. And so Wikipedia is actually this vast project of humanity that is not just a human project and that we all contribute to it and sustain it and make and, and actually propel it forward by virtue of the fact that as we continue to read it, you know, that is in of itself a reclamation of the importance of knowledge in our world. But also that it can change as our societies change, that it can become more inclusive as we struggle, as we uh, strive to become more inclusive and understanding, that it helps us create connections among one another, and that there really are these pie-eyed optimists out there in the world who donate hundreds, if not thousands of hours a year to make this whole thing possible with knowing that they will always be anonymous to most of the folks who ever read Wikipedia. And so, it's a good reason for me to get up in the morning and I am as grateful as anything that I could possibly share for all of the time that I had with these remarkable people and this remarkable project. You know, listening to you talk about that, I, I think, you know, you come to a website and you see, you see words and, you know, maybe if you're a tech geek, you go and you look at the code, but what you can't see are all the people behind it. You know, and I often think about that with National Observer and all the people who come to our website and they see articles, but I know that all of that is people. And what you've just described, you know, as this incredible community around the world is so amazing and moving and I'm very hopeful. And so Catherine, Thank you so much for your time and coming and being with us here in Canada. You know, when um, you have places all around the world, you could obviously be. So thank you for coming to Canada this evening. And um, for those of you listening in, I hope you'll join me again next Friday, March 26th for a special climate panel with the European Union and National Resources Canada. Um, this one's first thing early in the morning, so, you know, it'd be great to see if you can make it. Um, tonight's episode with Catherine was produced by Sharayer Tajvidi at the Canadian Centre for Journalism and with help from the amazing Janelle Johnson, Jenny Uechi, and Yamina Salamal. So, uh, Catherine, again, thank you so much. No, it was truly my pleasure. Thank you for having me. And thanks for inviting me to come speak to everyone who's listening tonight. Good luck and everything you're going to do from here. We'll be watching. Thank you. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye, everybody.